His life was a 77 years long performance. His fate is a sophisticated curve from a thousand canvases he painted. His life path is full of secrets, mysteries and contradictions. His creative heritage demands particular attention from thoughtful researchers. Who was he? Genius or madman? Ascetic artist or cosmic being? Almatian freak or urban legend? He's Sergei Kalmykov, an incredibly gifted man brought to Kazakhstan by the will of the stars. Riddles shrouded not only his life, but his death for many years remained one of his biggest mysteries. The most eccentric Almatian. Yes, he was not from his planet. Absolutely true, because his friends or partners in life were Lai Pichu Pai Lapa. The life of an artist as a book of miracles. His biography is filled with mysteries, conundrums, speculations, and hypotheses. The secret behind the last earthly refuge of Almatian genius. Now I must say what proves we actually found it. We know the name and the last name of his pallbearer. Now, when I first saw Kalmykov's paintings, I thought these were the works of different artists. It's amazing how one person can create such a variety of styles and plots. I decided to find out what kind of person Sergei Kalmykov was. When I started studying his biography, every fact struck me and the number of secrets in his life could break records. I'm Daniel Besseden, and it is Searching for Mystery. Today, we will reveal the biggest mystery of Sergei Kolmykov. Sergei Kolmykov wrote thousands of pages in his diaries about his life, thoughts, and fantasies with sharp and graphic handwriting. He referred to himself as the great dresser, the most elegant man on the globe, the genius of the first rank of the interplanetary category, the master of color geometry, and the grandmaster of linear arts, great, naive, and immaculate. Whether joking or seriously, the artist exactly knew his role in art and appreciated the art in his soul. And even the fact that he turned out to be an artist should be considered a miracle, the finger of God, or the will of the stars. The boy was born weak and fragile. We know he could have died at least three times, but he was a miracle survivor. Later, he began to draw with such passion and fury that his parents decided not to interfere with him. At that time, the Kalmykovs lived in Samarkand on the duty of the head of the family. And the first Asian scenes seen by the future artist got imprinted in his memory. From Uzbekistan, the Kalmykovs returned to Arinbur, their hometown, where Sergei graduated from a local gymnasium. And at the age of 18, he entered the art school of Konstantin Ion in Moscow. Later, he continued his studies with teachers in St. Petersburg. You see, he just had his own system of values. He was born when everything around was changing. He was born even earlier. He studied in St. Petersburg under Petrov Vodkin, the Bozhinsky members of World of Art, and all these brethren. Drop the art from the ship of modernity was their slogan. 
In Moscow and later in St. Petersburg, Kalmykov plunged into the world of art. It was the time when Chagall and Kandinsky, Malevich and Filonov were in their prime. The poets of the Silver Age recited their fresh, sonorous lines. The scientific works of Chizhevsky and Tsiolkovsky enchanted their contemporaries. The problems of space flight occupied many minds and awakened the imagination of young Kalmykov. He eagerly absorbed the atmosphere of pre-revolutionary capital cities and work as an apprentice with famous artists comprehending the secrets of the shape, light and color. On the eve of the October Revolution, red was probably the most in-demand color. Until now, disputes are still open on whom Kuzma Petrov Vodkin depicted in his famous 1912 painting Bathing of a Red Horse. Judging by the correspondence, the artist used the features of Shura, his beloved cousin Alexander Trofimov. At the same time, Sergei Kalmykov, a student of Petrov Vodkin, claimed otherwise. Note for the future compilers of my monograph. On a red horse, our dearest Kuzma Sergeyevich portrayed me. Me, myself, and I is depicted as a languishing young man on that banner. Another curious thing. A year earlier, in 1911, Sergei Kalmykov paints his canvas depicting swimming red horses and shows it to his mentors. This student work by Kalmykov could have inspired Kuzma Petrov Vodkin to create his famous bathing of a red horse. Sergei Kalmykov came to Kazakhstan at age of 44. He was already a mature person with his own views on life, art and his role in art. He was a prominent representative of the Russian avant-garde. Abai Kazakh National Opera and Ballet Theatre in Almaty. Back in 1935, the set decorator Sergei Galimikov came to work here. However, this building didn't exist at that time, and the theatre itself was called just Musical Theatre. The building would be constructed in 1941. The important thing is that Sergei Kalmykov would spend more than a quarter of a century of his creative life here. So in 1935, Kalmykov ended up in Almata and lived here until his death in 1967. His whole life, his most mature and probably his most interesting and established period of the work is associated with the city and especially with the theater. Despite the fact that Kalmykov came to Almata as an established artist, his name was not very famous in these years. He suffered inside the cage of social realism, where happy workers and villagers, bright and cheerful builders of communism, were the core of art. Every now and then he presented cosmic images, fantastic characters, riots of shapes, hues and colors. And gradually he earned the image of a person out of this world. Yes, he was not from this planet, absolutely true. Because his friends or partners in life were Lai Pichu Pai Lapa, imaginary creatures, as a variety of their own portraits. And pay attention, when you look through, there are a lot of them. Well, shortly before the start of World War II, he came up with a character, Parka, the harbinger of wars. These works are very similar to the scenes of the 21st century. They depict something like concrete bunkers with some kind of eye sockets, some kind of phantasmagoria on the one hand, and on the other hand, it's very reminiscent of today's world. That's what I'm talking about. He probably didn't actually foresee this, but his fantasy led him in that direction. The looks of the artist were catchy and conspicuous, sometimes even provocative. His appearances on the street brought crowds of spectators. Boys ran after him with laughter. Serious adults twisted their fingers at their temples. But anyway, it's difficult to imagine Almata of 1940s, 1960s without him. 
Walking around the city in strange, ridiculous outfits, he was the living landmark of the place. Yuri Dombrovsky wrote about him in his novel, The Faculty of Useless Things. The 21st century was outdated for him. He worked for the 22nd century. Kalmykov worked hard and selflessly. He used any available paper, cardboard, old newspapers, and fabrics. It rarely comes up, but some researchers have looked for Masonic symbols in Kalmykov's paintings. Squares, triangles, compasses. Of course, there are a lot of mystical implications. Even if we talk about his works, his fantasy and the real things are so naturally combined there that probably thanks to his boundless fantasy and imagination, his artistic works acquire some kind of inexplicable value and substantive content, along with the appearance and presentation that make them truly unique and special. The richness of the colors, shapes, and images that he mastered contrasted with extraordinary asceticism, need and even poverty of his everyday life. The furniture in the apartment where the artist lived consisted of piles of newspapers ties with ropes, old papers, sketches, drawings, and diaries. There was a creative mess everywhere, even borderline disarray. Sergei Kalmakov was a well-known vegetarian and ate very little. A singer at the opera house, where he knew almost everyone, and almost everyone knew him well, asked him once, why don't you eat anything? She cooked some parties at home or something like that and offered him as a treat. He replied with, ah, deliver me from eating patties. I eat nothing but milk, bread and onions. The onions he talked about were not shallots or scallions, but round winter onions. This eccentricity of the master at first surprised a lot. Some called him a widow and tried to avoid him. But people close to him guessed that, that the lonely artist simply didn't have enough money for hearty meals, because the entire salary and later the pensions went to books about art, which Kalmykov eagerly read, expensive oil paints, canvases, paper, and brushes. The local historian Vladimir Praskurin, in his essay dedicated to Kalmykov, wrote that he was friend with the writer Oleg Merkulov. Fate brought them together in the third district, when Sergei Ivanovich had retired and was in a great need of money. At every meeting, Merkulov tried to put some small change into Sergei's pockets. Kalmykov could reject large bills something suspicious and dangerous. He never let any strangers into his apartment. In the last years of his life, the artist wrote more and more often in his diary, I'm hungry. Sometimes he even imagined himself as a well-fed married man raising his daughters, but he immediately chased his thoughts away. What kind of family life can a real genius have? A grumpy, ill-tempered character, dedication to art, and a table stained with paints didn't fit into the, any kind of family life in any way. However, Kalmykov had his own female muse. Her name was Olga Spilko, and she lived in Orenburg. Kalmykov corresponded with her all his life. Sometimes she ordered sketches from him, and in return, she would send him quite an explicit photographs of herself. The photo of Olga Spilko became the basis for his painting with the figure of a naked woman in a hat in the front and bathing red horses at a distance. Theater and movie director, honored artist, author of the trilogy about Kalmykov, Igor Ganapolsky, told us an interesting story. During the shooting, inexplicable and even partly mystical things took place. 
Well, actually, a lot of incomprehensible things happened. Let's say once we left for lunch and the door closed by itself. It was just closed. There was a lateral bolt with a lock hanging on it. So we just locked the door and left. We did lock it. We left. We had lunch. We came back, opened the lock, removed the bolt, but the door remained closed. Someone closed it from the inside. This is one case. The second one occurred when we were doing dubbing at the Telefilm studio. It was located on the hill. Back then there was a Kazakh Telefilm studio building. Now it's the Habar agency. We came to the studio to continue recording the sound, so we came to the studio, but the equipment there just didn't work. Sound engineer found out that their wires were broken although the room was locked. Later, I donated all of Kalmykov's works to museums. When I started restoring these four or five works before giving them to the museums, they were hanging in my father's house. My son spent some nights in that house, I mean with his grandparents. When he spent the night in the room with those two works, for some reason he cried and felt frightened at night. Some strange things were definitely happening. Now, I'm not superstitious, I don't believe in any kind of mysticism. But I do believe the words of Igor Gnopolsky. While working on this episode, our TV crew has faced some great difficulties. Our director got into a car accident on the way to a shoot. By the way, none of the shoots started on time. They were all exactly one hour late. We started to feel that the artist himself doesn't want us to reveal his secrets. Exotic appearance and eccentric behavior didn't prevent Sergei Kolmakov from doing his job as a decorator. He was a member of the Union of Artists of Kazakhstan and was awarded a medal for his exemplary work. But his lifestyle was so different from conventional standards that many contemporaries regarded the artist as crazy. Now we can say with certainty that he had a formal diagnosis. His medical history is stored in the Central State Archive of the city of Almaty. Transcripts of his medical records are also available to the public online. You know, I think that probably, broadly speaking, Kolmakov's personality and his biography are full of mysteries, conundrums, speculations and hypotheses, which will continue to excite minds for many years, as long as there is an active interest in him and his work. At least I believe so. Accordingly, it will cause a wide variety of opinions and assessments, possibly diametrically opposed. Some would say one thing, others would say the other. This is ordinary, unremarkable district of Almat. Gray, high-rise block buildings. People are jostling you in their hurry. Do they know that a prominent avant-garde artist, the last master of the Russian Silver Age, a man that today is placed on par with Malevich, Kandinsky, Chagall, spent his last years here? According to unofficial statistics, Kalmykov is one of the most forged artists in the country. His authentic paintings now cost millions. Presumably, I should thank my life for the fact that I, so far I haven't been lucky. If I had been lucky, I would most likely have died long ago. And right now, I just can't die. All my works would be gone. They would say they're formal and meaningless, and no one needs them. Well, until it is clear that everyone needs all my engravings, fiction and notes, until then, I will try my best to prove that everyone needs them. So I have to live to be a hundred years old. Sergei Kalmykov has set himself the incredible task 
of living more than a hundred years and living at least a million works such as paintings and fantastic stories, vivid sketches and biographical notes. However, disreptitude, weakness and death, as always, were imminent. But the master fulfilled his task in many aspects. Now, the Central Archive contains 75 volumes of his manuscripts, thousands of different notes, letters, stories, essays, millions of lines written by Sergei Kolmakov. Now, Abulhan Kastiev Museum of Art stores the biggest collection of his artworks. 1,111 paintings made by this amazing person. Actually, he recognized his own chosenness and genius, and he really wanted to create a symbolic museum of his work. And given the incredible amount of the collection in the Kastiev Museum of Arts, we can say that the creative heritage of Kolmakov, a painter, draughtsman, and theater artist, found a safe shelter inside the walls of our museum. From the case report number 840, we know that on March 19, 1967, Sergei Kolmakov was brought by ambulance to a psychiatric ward diagnosed with senile psychosis against severe general physical exhaustion. On April 27, he passed away. I wonder how they will bury me. Crowds of young people will come to mourn me. All institutions will be grieving, wrote the artist in his diaries. But the world took the news of the death of legendary Almatinian artist silently and indifferently. Thanks to the efforts of the head of Shevchenko Art Gallery, Lyubov Plachotnaya, the apartment of the late artist was sealed and all his materials were transferred to archives and distributed to museums including the psychiatric museum managed by Marx Ganapolsky, the chief psychiatrist and archaeologist of Kazakhstan in those years. So when he died, everything that he had in his apartment was brought to the Central State Archive. The Central State Archive of film and photo documents and sound recordings on Abai Street. All this was piled up in the yard found out about this, came to my father and said, let's go there and take what they consider useless. Well, he gave me the keys to the Moskvich, which belonged to the institute, and I drove it there. All materials were divided into three piles. One pile contained what would be given to the Kastiev Museum. In the second pile, there were materials for the archive, and the third one was intended for destruction, because all the things in it were dirty. And I took everything that was going to be burned, and destroyed and brought the Department of Psychiatry on Kablukov Street. There was a large closet and I put all the materials there. From time to time, when I came to my father, I rummaged through the pile and if something seemed worthy to me, I took it and gave it for restoration. But what happened to the body of the artist? For 55 years, the answer to this question remained a mystery. Today I'm going to meet the people who can prove that they found the final resting place of this legendary man. Hi, I'm Daniel. Hello, Anna. Nice to meet you. Okay. Here it is, Kolmakov's grave. How do you know that's the real? Because we've been looking for this grave for a long time. It's been a year since we started our search. And we did a whole lot of research. We took photos of, of all the nearby graves because it gave us the opportunity to check in the registry of the dead who and when was buried. The search for the burial place was carried out by a group of Almatian tour guides and search enthusiasts led by journalist Evgenia Marosova. 
And as often happens in such situations, pure coincidence and common friends in social media help to discover the place. I'm subscribed to the blog of a Russian art critic. And she made a short post about Kalmykov, and it was concluded with the words that he died in 1967 and was buried in a central cemetery. But the exact location of his grave is unknown. Normally, any article about Kalmykov ended with these words. But the very first comment under this post was, I know where Kalmykov's grave is. It was written by Oleg Fyodorov from Almaty. As it turned out later, his mother, also an artist, was buried next to the wanted grave. Since his childhood, he knew that next to his mother lay the greatest Kazakhstani artist of the 20th century. I wrote to Oleg and we met with him. He's an old man and long retired. We met with him and went to the cemetery as a small research group. It consists of me, my daughter, and partner in various projects, Anna Dikterova, and the famous cemetery enthusiast Georgi Afonin. I called him for a reason, as we did a lot of projects together, and I knew it was important for him. He searched for this grave for nearly a decade. And we, as a team, went to the cemetery. We knew the approximate site where Kolmikov was buried, but the problem was that no tombstone left on the grave. He was a lonely man. He had a very simple grave marker. It was made of a cheap wood. And since so many years have passed, this grave marker just rotted and decomposed. The researchers are sure that they managed to find the final resting place of the legendary artist. Now the grave is fenced and cross with inscription is placed there. But not all witnesses of the last day of Sergei Kolmakov's life are that positive about it. I absolutely exclude such a possibility. Those who worked in the hospital at that time had never done such thing and wouldn't do it. For them, he was just a patient by the name of Sergei Kolmakov, who brought himself to such point of exhaustion that he died. That's it. He had no relatives in Almata. If there had been relatives, the body would have been given to them. If there were no relatives, the body would have been given to the anatomical museum at the medical institute. I am more inclined towards this outcome. There was not a single person in Almata who would take care of his funeral. There was simply no physical presence of such people. Well, actually, he's wrong. And I think that he's mistaken, probably because he doesn't know the specifics of this work. Now I must say what proves we actually found it. We know the name and the last name of his pallbearer. It was Valentina Zaharova, his colleague. Found relatives of Valentina Zaharova. We talked to her sister, since Valentina herself had already died by that time. We talked to her sister and her stepson. And they all told us that they worked together at the Opera and Ballet Theater. They lived in adjacent rooms in the barracks. And later they lived in neighboring houses in the district. What more proof do you need? There was an actual person who organized his funeral. Exhumation of the body could shut down debates on this controversial issue. However, no relatives of Sergei Kolmakov live in Almaty, so it will not be possible to do a DNA test. And researchers are sure that looking for his family in Russia to carry out this procedure is costly and completely unnecessary. But whatever it is, I believe that the most important, the biggest positive aspect of this find is that people of Almaty now have a memorable place on the city map, the place where Kolmakov is buried. And even if we find out that he is not in that grave, let's assume that it's still him. He has to find his last home. That is my opinion. Now, Kalmakov was definitely an extraordinary man who had an extraordinary life. 
Some people say that even the grave you have seen today is not even his. I don't know. The DNA analysis was not done. Who to believe? You guys to decide. But that was one cool story. I'm Daniel Besseden for Searching for Mystery, and I'll see you again.